I'm not going to insult your intelligence here. You already know about Mario. I'm sure everyone watching this is already familiar with the beginning of the series, the spin-off games, even your parents know about this absolute phenomenon. Nintendo did an incredible job reviving the home console market and defining how even the most estranged person's image of video games looks like. We are hot off the heels of Mario's 35th anniversary and I've been playing the 3D All-Stars collection, going on a quick trip down Nostalgia Road with Mario 64 and finally getting a chance to try Sunshine and Galaxy. Although something jumped out to me about this event. This is the 35th anniversary of the release of Super Mario Bros, which is definitely worthy of its own talking points, but this isn't the beginning of Mario. I figured with this oversight it's a perfect time to talk about the titles Mario was a part of before the Super Series, how his character and setting evolved, and what ignited the 1985 explosion that was soon to come. Just a fair warning here, as I did not grow up with any of these games and due to current conditions, I don't have the option to go out and try any of these titles in their original arcade format. Also as I look into the more obscure areas of these games, some of the software is totally out of my hands and I wouldn't be able to get it without some serious money. Outside of that, we begin with our first title. So, technically, this isn't Mario. Great start, right? His name was Jumpman at the time, but in hindsight, this is our protagonist's first appearance. Nintendo's team R&D 1 was, and to a degree, still is in charge of the creation and manufacturing of arcade games. The kinds of titles you can still find today at your trendy hipster bars and cramped collector's collections. Donkey Kong was the first game to truly break out in the West. The video game crash was finally recovering, and people were willing to go out and play again. If not in their homes, then in arcades. Originally, this game was going to be a Popeye-branded cabinet, with the goal being to save olive oil from the evil clutches of Bluto. But the deal fell through and sparked a cultural wildfire. Back then, all you needed to play a game was a joystick and a button. Moving Mario left and right, up and down ladders, a theme we will see a lot more of, and jumping over various obstacles with mixed results. You only get three screens here, afterwards looping to the beginning, beckoning you to go for a high score. Coming custom with the familiar rigging controls you find in these older games, the closest to the native set of today would be an analog stick, and it misses the original design, and honestly, the only time you'd get your money's worth out of playing any of these games is to actually find a cabinet and trying it. Outside of that, you're only looking at maybe 15 minutes of interest without that extra retro magic. If you were looking for the same arcade feel but with smoother control scheme, I recommend checking out Donkey Kong or colloquially known as Donkey Kong 94. This was a Game Boy game released in... Yeah, you got it. The first stage is a straight-up recreation of the original Donkey Kong game, but with a myriad of new movement options. After the original endpoint of the arcade game, you go on a puzzle platforming adventure that holds up to this day. Granted, I imagine what draws people to playing the original isn't going to be the same as this game can provide, but Overall, I think this game is a better experience. To be fair, this game does take place after 85, so if you're looking for the OG handheld experience, you would have to look towards a part of often forgotten Nintendo tech. Unless you shell out for one of those remade handhelds, there aren't many options to play these games, but luckily there is this restoration site that houses a few of the titles with the original art. Yeah, that is technically Mario, eventually retconned as Mr. Game & Watch later. It's like these three versions of Mario reach some sort of convergent pink and split apart into three separate people. And as you can guess, there isn't much to these games, but I imagine back when choosing between having one of these or mindlessly playing on a calculator, it would feel like a real luxury. Honestly, playing any version of Donkey Kong is going to be a novel concept, so as far as novel goes, this might have the most kick. But maybe this intense ladder-climbing gameplay lacks story for you. What will you do then? Well, Nintendo, off this major success from Donkey Kong, was able to turn out a sequel within a year. 
Simply changing the motherboard and repainting the machine, I think the goal here was to emulate the same gameplay with a faster pace and a little more variation. We also get to dip our toes into a motive, as weird as it turns out to be. Mario takes a strange place in this game's story as the antagonist, capturing Donkey Kong and leaving DK Jr. to come to his rescue. As out of character as this seems, you have to remember that he wasn't even Mario at this point. Canonically, this is Jumpman doing these dastardly deeds. We are still in an era where most games don't have any concern when it comes to story or narrative. It was all about having a loop that would get people to pump quarters into the machine. This feels like a real improvement over the original Donkey Kong. There's more verticality with the vines, and the obstacles and enemies lead to more fun choices and maneuverability. But it is worth saying that we are still doing the four level loop with vines taking the place of ladders and controls janking out about as often as it would in the original. Thank god they didn't fix that fall death height. We also have the game and watch version here, but there's not much more to it than the other handheld, but that's business, baby! There was also a Donkey Kong 3, but for whatever reason they ditched Mario to include this kid. In most cases, you would see this as a replacement to the original character to make way for something new, but Mario takes a step outside of the series to embark on his own self-titled game. I think the point here was to create a game that can bank off the popularity of the Donkey Kong series while not replacing it. It's also a chance to finally introduce co-op gameplay, no matter how aggravating it is. Here, we finally see the classic elements that make up any good Mario game. Coins, turtles, pipes, all things plumbery. In full honesty, this game isn't that much fun. It sits a lot nicer as a bonus game with the Super Mario Advance 2, where the meat of the experience is in Super Mario World. I think the vertical climbing and enemy crushing feedback was done a lot better in Ice Climbers, which came out a year later. The original Mario might have the seed of theme and motive to what Mario will become, but overall this gameplay is hard to call anything other than stagnant. I think Nintendo might have felt this way too, as they followed this game up with a brand new profession. This game came out the same year as Super Mario Bros, and truly cements Mario as an all-around handyman in the blue-collar field. Wrecking Crew is without a doubt the best version of the ladder-climbing, enemy-dodging gameplay that we've seen up to this point, but strangely, this title has never really been brought up when referring to classic Nintendo titles. I imagine it has to do with it not really working with the rest of the themes Mario began to develop at this point in the series, and it may also be due to the soon-to-release Super Mario Bros taking this archaic arcade style and blowing it completely out of the water. It's like, this was the perfect version of a game that everyone was so tired of playing, and because of that, it was swiftly forgotten. Even before the Extreme Blast-Off Mario is soon to launch, you can still see his place as a moderating easter egg in Nintendo games, mainly here as the referee in tennis. Of course, you can also find him as the referee in Punch-Out, and making an appearance in really any Nintendo game that has sports in it, but these all take place after 1985, so they don't fit our bill. And there's also Golf! Golf! He's golfing! Look at that boy go! So, after this point, we have the release of Super Mario Bros, and the rest is history soon to be written. These early games mean so much more than their presentation. This is the period before story, before setting and motive, and really the ground floor of what games used to be. It took unparalleled effort, a delicate touch, and honestly a miracle to kick off the world of games that we have today. And while Mario might not be the most story-heavy game to say the least, it is the first time that games could be more than just a whittling distraction. We wouldn't have the touching, difficult, and beautiful experience we have today without this groundwork. And to me, that makes this all a wonderful kind of magic. All of this that we just talked about is the work that takes Mario to the starting line, and the gun is about to fire.